Hi, everyone. This is Mo Bhandari from uh, Ortho Evidence, Editor-in-Chief, and I'm here uh, today to chat about um, a late-breaking trial, a trial I think uh, in many ways uh, will inevitably change practice. I'm here with uh, Andy Metcalf, who is an Associate Professor of Trauma and Orthopedics at the University of Warwick and is a practicing orthopedic surgeon. Andy, welcome, and thank you very much for uh, spending a bit of time with us this morning. I'm going to let you give the uh, breaking news on the trial and a little bit about the trial that we're talking about today. Right. Well, look, thank you ever so much for having me. It's a, it's a fantastic, um, this is a fantastic platform to be able to talk about our trial, and I'm really excited to be able to join you. So, um, yeah, so really, I find this a really interesting trial to do. Um, I think, um, you know, many of your uh, listeners will know that, that actually tears of the rotator cuff tendon that you can't repair a really tricky orthopedic problem. Um, so you get this group of people um, where they've got a, you know, often a large um, rotator cuff tear. You can't bring it back to, to where to its attachments. You can't repair it. Um, they're not at the point of wanting arthroplasty. Um, and so they're there, but they're getting a lot of pain and dysfunction and it's surprisingly disabling and painful. So there's a, um, it's a sort of unresolved problem in orthopedics, and there's a whole wealth of treatments that are set out to deal with it. Some of them, um, some of them a bit more traditional, some of them really innovative. Um, and this device came on the market, um, I think initially in 2010 in Europe, um, but has really increased over the past sort of probably four or five years, particularly in the UK. Um, and it's a, it's a really innovative device, this um, balloon spacer device, the in-space device. So it's a dissolvable balloon device. Um, that's put into the subacromial space. Uh, they, you sort of need to do enough of a debridement to get the to get the device in effectively, um, and fill it up, and it's filled with saline, um, and it stays inflated for um, probably around three to four months before it um, effectively deflates, um, and then the materials effectively dissolved away by about twelve months. Um, and so, we, you know, it was a, a sort of innovative thing. It was getting a real buzz. It was really um, people were starting to pick it up gradually in their practice. Um, and increasingly, particularly in the UK, which is building a bit of a real interest in developing trials of this, there's a real recognition we needed to run a randomized trial and understood how effective it was. Um, and actually, it's a great, you know, as a trial, it's a great product to test in a trial because the comparison and the and the intervention are very similar. So, so you either do we either we compared a debridement of the subacromial space, which is a well accepted treatment for this in the UK to um, the debridement with the in-space device. So the neat thing about the trial is actually we're able to deliver the same, um, the same intervention, except that in one, the device was used at the end of the intervention. And that allowed us to randomize in theater as well. Um, so we um, did the, run this randomized control trial and it had 117 participants in it at the time. We used a sort of novel way of delivering, delivering this trial so that the sample size adapted to the um, to the emerging evidence, which was which is interesting, and we could perhaps talk about it another at, at a bit a bit later. Um, but the um, so uh, and then we followed them up up to twelve months, and we're actually collecting twenty four month follow up as well. But the primary outcome was at twelve months. Our primary outcome was the Oxford knee score, um, and it, sorry, the Oxford, <laughs> the Oxford, knee, Oxford <laughs> shoulder <laughs> score. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been in a knee conference for two days. There you <laughs> go. The, um, but the primary outcome was the Oxford shoulder score and the Oxford shoulder score at 12 months. Um, in the end, we found a difference between the two. Um, and actually, the debridement arm had a, a Oxford shoulder score that was slightly higher than the Oxford shoulder score at 12 months in the uh, in debridement within space group. So both groups improved compared to the baseline, uh, but the improvement was greater in the debridement only group. And that was statistically significant. Um, so you know, that was um, a really interesting finding, a surprising finding, not what, not at all what we expected to see when we set out, um, but I think important. Um, secondary outcomes were effectively in the same direction, although not significantly different. So um, secondary outcomes included the, um, the work score, so that's a rotator cuff specific score, uh, EQ5D, um, patient preference, so, so, you know, how satisfied are you? Do you feel like you've changed since your operation? And all of those were, in the same direction as the primary outcome, although not significant. So that's our sort of summary, summary of the of the of the of the findings. Right. So let me ask you a, a, a first question. Um, 
and, and I'll preface this by a, um, there was an editorial in 2020, I suspect you're, you're well aware of all the data that came up, but this was published in Arthroscopy. And it was based after, a, a, um, there was a, I think a case series of 51 patients in which the authors were, uh, you know, had published in Arthroscopy and then there was an editorial on it in which the quote was by, the, by those who wrote the editorial, I wait with eagerness as more studies on balloon spacers um, you know, are 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 uh, are coming up, are are coming ahead because the procedure is much much easier and much less technical than other options. You know, they were really really hoping that uh, you know this you know that the popularity uh, based uh, of the of this the spacer was going to continue and that you know future trials would in fact prove uh, what they already believed based on the case series. Were you at all surprised by? your trial results? Like, like, did you go in with the hypothesis that it was uh, superior and then just were surprised to see that in fact it was quite inferior? Or did you have a non-inferiority plan in the beginning? You thought, oh, there's probably no difference. No, so when we, when we first wrote the grant application for this, we didn't even consider this as a, we didn't think this would be possible at all. You know, we, were, yes. we totally said we were looking to find out, is it superior? Or maybe it's not superior, but we yeah. need to do this. Yeah. And and the possibility of finding a result in the other direction was was not even on the radar. But it you know shows how important these trials are. Um, and I think this speaks a lot for me to um, what K series tell us and and the bit yeah. of the risks about relying on K series data. So one thing we did quite a bit at the start of this trial was we looked at K series data that had been published across rotator cuff tears. So so not just. Um, not just in you know the balloon device or but in a whole range of treatments for right. rotator tears and what we found was that um what we found was that in basically every arm of every trial that's been published so 57 trials published at the time we did a big systematic review mm -hmm. and everyone got better uh, from baseline so so if you look at baseline and you look at outcome people will improve and and that's probably a function of what happens to people with scores over time and um, so, yeah. so, so basing your say on, you know, this looks promising on an improvement over a year or two years or three years doesn't isn't really great evidence. And that's this thing about we need trials for new procedures. Um, and I think that's been my big lesson over this is if we're going to do new things, we need to get them into trials pretty quickly. I, I think you're absolutely right. I, the one thing I think that you, you, you mentioned it is about the your adaptive trial design. One big challenge, I think, especially when facing uh, not so common uh, clinical uh, situations like this, like, you know, massive tears that are irreparable, um, you know, getting numbers and getting patients. And so ideally, the most efficient use of a randomized trial is to recruit just the exact number of patients you need to be able to come up with a, what we would hope would be a definitive answer. Can you speak a little bit to how your design allowed you to do that and not lead to an inflated sample size or something that was too small, for example? Yeah, yeah, and I totally agree. And then, and then there's a second thing about, you know, multi-center recruitment. We had 24 sites to deliver right. this sort of recruitment efficiently. Um, but, but yeah, so the, so this was a this was um, one of the things that was really interesting in running this trial. We actually, when it was when this trial was funded, they the funding body had asked for a novel to look at novel trial designs for new surgical procedures, which was a great opportunity to to um, do something a little bit a little bit different. And a good way of thinking about this study is it, it's almost a study of two aspects. One study is the, the clinical study, right? The thing that's trying to find out if this thing works. And the other one was running this, we, we ran this adaptive sample size. And, and we agree, you know, and, and the concept at the start was, well, we pick these sample size calculations because, you know, based on often quite sparse data beforehand. And we say, you know, and we make sure they're really big because we think they need to be big. But, but in many studies, you know, you might spend half the study just narrowing a confidence interval when you already know the answer. If you were to look at the results beforehand, obviously you don't look at the results beforehand. Yeah. So, um, so what we did was we right at the very start of the study, we did a whole load of statistical simulations with um, We've got some very, 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 very experienced adaptive design st statisticians in our unit. And they ran a whole load of computer simulations about all the possibilities of how a trial could end up. And, and using that, we were able to construct a set of statistical boundaries around which you might choose to say, well, actually the data already tells us that our sample size will be sufficient or the data tells us that our sample size is too much. So, so it's not prejudging the outcome of the trial, it's saying the sample size is already sufficient. And I think that's one of the challenges we had. So when we stopped, people said, well, you already know the results, but we didn't already know the results. We just knew that our sample size was enough. Um, and right. what was particularly 
what was particularly clever about the way the statisticians set this up was we didn't just use the 12 month outcome to inform that decision. We used a correlation between the three, the six and the 12 months. So all of the data, you know, you collect this massive wealth of data in these trials and then, and then it's quite easy to just ignore a lot of that data. So yes. we pulled a lot of that. We pulled the three and the six month and 12 month data in. They were actually incredibly tightly correlated um, between those time points and used that to inform a decision about whether the sample size would be enough. Um, Understood. And that seems a high risk thing to do, but when you look at the statistical simulations, it's it's remarkably robust and makes remarkably little difference to your power, um, actually. So yeah, which would which, and it worked really nicely in this. Let me ask you this, Andy, from from the perspective of um, practice change, do you believe um, that this trial will lead to an important change in practice? I mean, you know. We often we we've seen a little bit of, of the storyline about trials around uh, you know arthroscopic knee surgery for example for osteoarthritis and we saw that yes while it did curb and you know guidelines started shifting it took some time quite a bit of time and there was a lot of pushback. What do you anticipate will happen now? Uh, that's a really that's a really good question. Um, I, th I think we're at a very different phase in the product cycle. For the for this and in the and in the uptake cycle um, and I think the feedback we're having from certainly from the UK surgeons we've spoken to a lot more and we're starting to see from you know the sort of international community as they're responding to this um, you know people I think how people respond to trials depends a little bit on how invested they are in a technique beforehand you know they've been doing it for ten years already they really believe strongly it works for them they've seen lots of results already and um, is very different to a product that they're do I take it up or don't I? I'm not quite sure what my uptake is going to be. Um, and the feedback we're getting now is, you know, people aren't struggling with this, but I really don't want to give this up. And this trial totally doesn't fit with my bias. A lot of people are saying we just needed to know the answer. And, and so I'm hopeful we're going to get a much quicker uptake than, than, than many trials have had in elective orthopedics, which has been a 10, 15, 20 year process, as right. you say, and it's yeah. So no, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know what? And like, I'll tell you something that goes similar to something we had done some years ago. We did this trial called the flow trial in which we had believed wholeheartedly with small trials and, you know, uh, preclinical data that adding a cast towel soap into an open wound was a good thing because soap is good. It's good. Turned out the trial had to complete off. It was harm. You know, it was harmful. And that immediately led to a shift. It just halted the use of, it seemed to me to be pretty much overnight. I think because you've almost demonstrated harm here. I mean, if you, if you look at, I mean, <clears throat> like the increased, you know, a trend towards more complications, more SAEs and, and significantly less function, it seems to be fairly clear. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll see if there'll be others who will look to um, conduct similar trials in other places to see. But my perception is that, that this will have, if not halted, uh, put a significant, um, breaks on on enthusiasm for this product in one way it's not a bad thing it's a good thing because now you're going to be able to spend energy and time looking at other innovative uh, you know uh, treatments therapies approaches that could actually help patients with these uh, very difficult problems um any last words on your uh, point any any big lesson or message that you'd like to give to the orthopedic community and our community in ortho evidence is is fairly broad um including a lot of um, you know individuals who are specialists in, in, in physiotherapy and rehab as well yeah so i suppose i should to, you know to put these results in context and, and in the back of your comments what we've just said i should i should um also to explain, there's another trial. You know, there's been another trial published on the device, almost within like a week after ours or something, in JBJS, and 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 you know, it's a good, high quality trial as well. Um, and the, I think this, you know, this what this says to the, to the way that science is developing in orthopedic surgery is that is that actually we really are delivering trials now, and there's an increasing, you know, increasing acceptance and belief that that's what we need to do for new products. And for me, that's the, that's the, you know, for me, that's the future. And um, so it's, you know, you can take, you can take our trial, you can take the, the, the other trial that's been published, you can try and compare and contrast, and that's important and valuable. But I mean, you know, how many products over the past few decades have had two large multi-center trials published very early in their acceptance cycle? And I think that's, um, I think that's testament to, to where we're going with new products and, and, and how they should be tested and evaluated. 
And so, my, so, so I suppose my message is that as orthopedic surgeons, we need to start looking for that and expecting that and asking for that. Um, and I think for me, if nothing else, this trial has demonstrated that that's what we need to do is, is look at trial evidence and stop, stop paying attention to case series evidence. On that note, an appropriate one. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Metcalf. And uh, once again, to our uh, listeners and our viewers, uh, take a look at the paper, both in, uh, published in the original content, as well as the advanced clinical evidence report that we've put out. Uh, and we look forward to more great work from this group uh, from the uh, UK. Thanks so much, Andy, and uh, wishing you the best, uh, best of the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate it. Take care.